Hey, hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of Dad Reads a Bedtime Story. We're going to jump right into it. If you guys recall, we left off with R.L. Stein's Goosebump series, My Harry's Adventure. So let's go ahead and jump right here into chapter four. Larry, what's your problem? Lily demanded. Just pour a little on your hand and rub it on. But, 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 I sputtered. Do I look darker? Christina asked Lily. Is it working? No, not yet, Lily told her. She turned back to me. What's wrong, Larry? The l label, I stammered. It says, do not use after February 1991. Everyone laughed. Their laughter rang off the tile walls in the narrow bathroom. It can't hurt you, Lily said, shaking her head. So what if the stuff is a little old? That doesn't mean it'll make your skin fall off. Don't wimp out, Manny said, grabbing the bottle and tilting the top toward my hand. Go ahead, pour it. We've all done it, Larry. Now it's your turn. I think my skin is starting to tan, Christina said. She and Jared were admiring themselves in the mirror over the sink. Go ahead, Larry, Lily urged. Those dates on the labels don't mean anything. She shoved my arm. Put it on. What could happen? I could see that they were all staring at me now. My face grew hot, and I knew that I was blushing. I didn't want them to call me a wimp. I didn't want to be the only one to chicken out. So I tilted the bottle down and I poured the last sticky glob of the liquid onto the palm of my hand. Then I splashed it onto my face and I rubbed it all over. I covered my face, my neck, and the back of my hands. It felt cool and creamy. And it did have a sweet smell. A little like my dad's aftershave. The others cheered while I finished rubbing the cream in. Way to go, Larry. <laughs> Jared clapped me on the back so hard I nearly dropped the, inst the empty Instatan bottle. We all pushed and shoved, struggling to get a good view of ourselves in a small medicine chest mirror. Manny gave Jared a hard shove and sent him sprawling into the shower. How long is this supposed to take? Christina asked. The bright ceiling light reflected off her glasses as she studied herself in the mirror. I don't think it's working at all, Lily said, letting out a disappointed, a disappointed sigh. I'll study the label again. It says we should have a dark, good-looking tan almost instantly, I reported. I shook my head. I knew this stuff was too old. I knew we shouldn't have. Manny's shrill scream cut off my words. We all turned to him and saw his horrified, horrified expression. Mm -mm. My face, Manny shrieked. My face is falling off. He had his hands cupped. They trembled as he held them up. And I saw that he was holding a pale blob of his own skin. Oh, a weak moan escaped my lips. The other stared down at Manny's hands in silent horror. My skin, he groaned, my skin. And then a grin burst out over his face and he started to laugh. As he held, his, held up his hand, I saw that it wasn't a piece of pale skin at all. It was a wet, wadded up tissue. Laughing his head off, Manny let the tissue float down to the bathroom floor. You jerk, Lily cried angrily. We all, we all began shouting and shoving Manny. We pushed him into the shower. Lily reached for the knob to turn on the water. No, stop, Manny pleaded, laughing hard, struggling to break free. Please, it was just a joke. Lily changed her mind and backed away. We all took final glances into the mirror as we paraded out of the bathroom. No change, no tan. The stuff hadn't worked at all. We grabbed our coats and hurried back outside to finish the snowman. I took the empty, the empty Instatan bottle with me and tossed it into the snow as Lily and Christina rolled a snowball to make the head. Then they lifted it onto the snowman's body. I found two dark stones for eyes. Manny grabbed Jared's raider's cap and placed it on the snowman's head. It looked pretty good, but Jared quickly grabbed his cap back. It looks, it looks a lot like you, Manny, Jared said, except smarter. We all laughed. A strong gust of wind whipped around the side of the house. The wind toppled the snowman's head. It rolled off the body and crumbled to powder on the ground. Now it really looks like you, Jared, told Manny. Think fast, Manny cried. He scooped up a big handful of snow and heaved it at Jared. Jared tried to duck, but the snow poured over him. He instantly bent down, scooped up an even bigger pile of snow, and dropped it over Manny's head. This started a long, funny snowball fight amongst the five of us. Actually, it turned out to be Lily and me against Manny, Jared, and Christina. The two of us held our own for a while. Lily is the fastest snowball maker I ever saw. She can make one and throw it in the time it takes me to bend down and start rolling the snow between my gloves. The snowball fight quickly became a war. We weren't even bothering to make snowballs. We were just heaving big handfuls of snow at each other. And then we started rolling in the snow. 
and then we chased each other to the next yard where the snow was fresh and started another heavy-duty snowball fight. What a great time. We were laughing and shouting, all breathing hard, all steaming hot despite the cold, swirling winds. And then suddenly, I felt sick. I dropped to my knees, swallowing hard. The snow began to gleam brightly, too brightly. The ground swayed and shook. I felt really sick. What's happening to me? I wondered. Chapter 6 Dr. Merkin raised the long hypodermic needle. It gleamed in the light. A tiny droplet of green liquid spilled from the tip. Take a deep breath and hold it, Larry, the doctor instructed in his whispery voice. This won't hurt. He said the same words every time I had to see him. I knew he was lying. The shot hurt. It hurt every time I got one, which was about every two weeks. He grabbed my arm gently with his free hand. He leaned close to me, so close that I could smell the peppermint mouthwash on his breath. I took a deep breath and I turned away. I could never bear to watch the long needle sink into my arm. Ow! I let out a low cry as the needle punctured my skin. Dr. Merkin tightened his grip on my arm. That doesn't hurt much, does it? He asked, his voice just above a whisper. Not too much, I groaned. I glanced up at my mother. She was biting her lower lip, her face twisted in worry. She looked as if she were getting the shot. Finally, I felt the needle slide out. Dr. Merkin dabbed a cold, alcohol-soaked cotton ball against the puncture spot. You'll be okay now, he said, patting my bare back. You can put your shirt back on. He turned and smiled reassuringly at my mother. Dr. Merkin is a very distinguished-looking man. I guess he's about 50 or so. He has a straight white hair that slicks down and brushes straight back. He has friendly blue eyes behind square-shaped black eyeglasses and a warm smile. Even though he lies when he says the shot won't hurt, I think he's a really good doctor and I like him a lot. He always makes me feel better. Same old sweat gland problem, he told my mother, writing some notes in my file. He got overheated, and we know that's not good, don't we, Larry? I muttered a reply. I have a problem with my sweat glands. They don't work very well. I mean, I can't sweat, so when I get really overheated, I start to feel sick. That's why I have to see Dr. Merkin every two weeks. He gives me shots that make me feel better. Our snowball battle was a lot of fun, but out in the snow and cold wind, I didn't even realize I was getting overheated. That's why I started to feel weird. Do you feel better now, my mom asked as we made our way out of the doctor's office. I nodded. Yeah, I'm okay, I told her. I stopped at the door and turned to face her. Do I look any different, mom? Huh? She narrowed her dark eyes at me. Different how? Do I look like maybe I have a suntan or something, I asked hopefully. Her eyes studied my face. I'm a little worried about you, Larry, she said quietly. I want you to take a short nap when we get home, okay? I guess that meant I didn't look too tanned. I knew that Insta-Tan wouldn't work. The bottle was too old, and it probably didn't work even when it was new. It's hard to get a suntan in the winter, Mom commented as we headed across the snowy parking lot to the car. Tell me about it, I thought, rolling my eyes. Lily called me right after dinner. I felt a little sick, too, she admitted. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, I replied. I held the cordless phone in one hand and flipped the TV channels with the remote control in my other hand. It's a bad habit of mine. Sometimes I flip channels for hours at a time and never really watch anything. Howie and Marissa walked by after you left, Lily said. Did you massacre them? I asked eagerly. Did you bury them in snowballs? Lily laughed. No, we were all soaked and exhausted by the time Howie and Marissa showed up. We all just sort of stood there shivering. Did Howie say anything about their band, I asked. Yeah, Lily replied. He said he bought an Eric Clapton guitar book. He said he's learning some new songs that will blow us away. Howie should stick to drums. He is the worst guitar player in the world, I muttered. When he plays, the guitar actually squeaks. I don't know how he does it. How do you make a guitar squeak? Lily laughed. Marissa squeaks too, but she calls it singing. We both laughed. I cut my laughter short. Do you think Howie and the Shouters are any good? I don't know, Lily replied thoughtfully. Howie brags so much, you can't really believe him. He says they're good enough to make a CD. He says his dad wants them to make a demo tape so he can send it to all the big CD companies. Yeah, sure, I muttered sarcastically. We should sneak over to Howie's house some afternoon when they're all practicing, I suggested. We could listen at the window. Check them out. 
Marissa is actually a pretty good singer, Lily said. She has a nice voice. But she's not as good as you, I said. Well, I think we're getting better, Lily commented. Then she added, it's a shame we don't have a real drummer. I agree. Jerry's drum machine doesn't always play the same song we play. Lily and I talked about the Battle of the Bands a while longer. Then I said good night, turned off his phone, turned off the phone, and sat down at my desk to start my homework. I didn't finish until nearly ten. Yawning, I went downstairs to tell mom and dad I was going to sleep. Back upstairs I changed into pajamas and crossed the hall to the bathroom to brush my teeth. Under the bright bathroom light I studied my face in the mirror over the sink. No tan. My face stared back at me as pale as ever. I picked up my toothbrush and spread a small line of blue toothpaste on it. I started to raise the toothbrush to my mouth and then stopped. Hey, I cried out. The toothbrush dropped into the sink as I gazed at the back of my hand. At first I thought the hand was covered by a dark shadow, but as I raised it closer to my face I saw to my horror that it was no shadow. I let out a loud gulping sound as I stared at the back of my hand. It was covered by the by a patch of thick black hair. Chapter 7 Staring down, I shook the hand hard. I think I expected the black hair to fall off. I grabbed at it with my other hand and tugged it. Ow! The hair really was growing from the back of my hand. How can this be? I cried to myself. Holding the hand in the light, I struggled to stop it from trembling so that I could examine it. The hair was nearly a half an inch high. It was shiny and black, very spiky, very prickly. It felt kind of rough as I rubbed my other hand over it. Harry Larry. That dumb name Lily called me suddenly popped back into my head. Harry Larry. In the mirror, I could see my face turning red. They'll call me Harry Larry for the rest of my life, I thought unhappily, if they ever see this black hair growing out of my hand. I can't let anyone see this, I told myself, feeling my chest tighten in panic. I can't. It would be so embarrassing. I examined my left hand. It was as smooth as, and clear as ever. Thank goodness it's only one hand, I cried. I tugged frantically at the patch of black hair again. I pulled at it until my hand ached, but the hair didn't come out. My mouth suddenly felt dry. I gripped the edge of the sink with both hands, struggling to stop my entire body from trembling. What am I going to do now, I murmured. Do I have to wear a glove the rest of my life? I can't let my friends see this. They'll call me Harry Larry forever. That's how I'll be known for the rest of my life. A panicky sob escaped my throat. Got to calm down, I warned myself. Got to think clearly. I was gripping the sink so tightly my hands ached. I lifted them, then rolled up both pajama sleeves. Were my arms covered in black hair too? No. I let out a long sigh of relief. The square patch of prickly hair on the back of my right hand seemed to be the only hair that had grown. What to do, what to do? I could hear my parents climbing the stairs on their way to the bedroom. Quickly, I closed the bathroom door and locked it. Larry, are you still up? I thought you went to bed. I heard my mom call out from the hall. Just brushing my hair, I called. I brush my hair every night before I go to bed. I know it doesn't make any sense. I know it gets messed up the instant I put my head down on the pillow. It's just a weird habit. I raised my eyes to my hair, my dark blonde hair, so soft and wavy, so unlike the disgusting patch of spiky black hair on my head. I felt sick. My stomach hurtled up to my throat. I forced back my feelings of nausea and pulled open the door to the medicine chest. My eyes slid desperately over the bottles and tubes. Hair remover. I searched for the words hair remover. There is a such thing, isn't there? Not in our medicine cabinet. I read every jar, every bottle, no hair remover. I stared down at the black patch on my head. Had the hair grown a little bit or was I just imagining it? Another idea flashed into my mind. I pulled down my dad's razor. On the bottom shelf of the medicine cabinet, I found a can of shaving cream. I'll shave it all off, I decided. It will be easy. I watched my dad shave a million times. There was nothing to it. I started the hot water running on the sink. I splashed some onto the back of my hand. Then I rubbed the bar of soap over the bristly black hair until it got all lathery. My hands were wet and slippery, and the can of shaving cream nearly slid out of my grip but I managed to push the top and spray a pile of white shaving cream onto the back of my hand. I smoothed it over the ugly black hair. Then I picked up the razor in my left hand, held it under the hot water the way I'd seen Dad do, and I started to shave. It was so hard to shave with my left hand. 
The razor blade slid over the thick patch. The bristly hair came right off. I watched it flow down the sink drain. Then I held my hand under the faucet and let the water rinse away the rest of the shaving cream lather. The water felt warm and soothing. I dried off my hand and then examined it carefully. Smooth, smooth and clean. Not a trace of the disgusting black hair. Feeling a lot better, I put my dad's razor and shaving cream back in the medicine chest. Then I crept across the room to my bedroom, across the hall to my bedroom. Rubbing the back of my hand, enjoying its cool smoothness, I clicked off the ceiling light and climbed into bed. My head sank heavily into the pillow. I yawned, suddenly feeling really sleepy. What had caused that ugly hair to grow? The question had been nagging at me ever since I discovered it. Was it the Insta-Tan? Was it that old bottle of tanning lotion? I wondered if any of my friends had grown hair too. I had to giggle as I pictured Manny covered in hair like a big gorilla. But it wasn't funny. It was scary. I rubbed my hand, still smooth. The hair didn't seem to be growing back. I yawned again, drifting to sleep. Oh no, I'm itchy. I suddenly realized, half awake, half sleep. My whole body feels itchy. Is spiky black hair growing all over my body? All right, guys, we'll cut it off there and we'll start chapter eight in the next episode. See you guys tomorrow night.